Welcome to another Achieve CE live webinar. This course is approved by the Accreditation Council for Pharmacy Education, otherwise known as ACPE. Once you complete this webinar, your course credits will be reported to the CPE monitor and CE broker within 24 to 48 hours, and you will be emailed a certificate. Welcome to the last few minutes of this webinar will be dedicated to a live question and answer session with the instructor. Please feel free to enter your questions or comments in the chat below during the presentation, and they will be responded to by the instructor at the end. At the end of this webinar, a link to a short online survey will be provided in the chat. Please note that you must complete this survey in order to receive course credit. In case you're new here at Achieve CE, we focus on offering courses on the important trending topics of the day to keep you up to date in your field, while also satisfying your continuing education requirements. Aside from our live webinars, we also offer on-demand text and video courses to take at your convenience, all which are available in our membership. We're excited you're here today and hope you enjoy the webinar. With no further ado, I'll go ahead and pass it over to today's instructor. All right, well, it looks like it's Wednesday night and it's time for Pharmacy News and Views. Let's get started here. We have a whole lot to cover. I got to tell you about a really fun trip I took, and that's what's going to be our focus for tonight. Pharmacy News and Views on past and current treatments for mental illness. Hi, I'm Pete Kreckle. I'm a Chief CE's ACPE Administrator. I am a most unique breed of community pharmacist. I graduated from the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy in 1981 with this uh, lovely pharmacist standing next to me in this picture, my wife, Denise. I've been practicing independent community pharmacy for my entire career of 42 years. I began teaching at St. Francis University in 2005, taught for 16 years up there, and uh, taught everything from antibiotic therapy to obstetrics and gynecology. These, the disclosures, this activity was developed by Achieve CE free of any commercial support. I, Pete Kreckle, have the faculty for this educational event. I have no relevant financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Neither does Namini Patel, RPH and MBA, the planner for this educational event, also has no financial relationships with ineligible companies to disclose. Let's review our learning objectives. We're going to talk about COVID, recognize how the latest updates on the CDC uh, advice on COVID-19 may impact pharmacy practice. We're going to describe the clinical presentation management and prevention of seasonal trending diseases. We're going to re review the approved indication, common adverse effects and drug interactions of new drugs used to treat common diseases. And finally, we're going to identify important drug alerts by the FDA and implications for patient care. Let's talk about what's going on currently. Ooh, we're not so green, are we now? For the past couple months, that map was green. Even our home state of West Virginia, where I'm sitting now, we're turning yellow and it looks like Kentucky is really moving up on it. The COVID hospital admissions, uh, the numbers were down. It's a week to week thing. They were down 4.3%, but we're still at 5.93 hospital admissions. Remember back in May, we were less than one. So we're not now at uh, 5.93 hospital admissions per 100,000 people. Total deaths, however, were 12.5% up from the previous week. So this is uh, telling us we need to pay a little bit of attention. It looks like in some areas, we're seeing more and more COVID. Let's take a look at the uh, top five variants. Uh, we have EG.5 is now 24.5% up from 20.6. FL151 is up to 13.7. XBB116 is at 10.2. XBB2.3 at 7.2. XBB116.6 is at 9.9. .9. And XBB. 0.1.5, the one that the COVID shot is made after, 
Yep, that's a 2.2%. So yes, very interesting. Uh, we, uh, we're told that our COVID shots from our wholesalers should be available tomorrow uh, where I work. And uh, that XBB15 formulation, well, XBB15 is now making up a total of yeah, 2.2%. Not to worry though, all of these are direct lineages of the XBB virus. So uh, we should have a pretty robust immunity because this whole top 10 uh, of the variants are of the XBB lineage. But isn't it interesting on April 15th, the XBB15 was 89%. 89% of the country. That's when they made the decision that they're going to go with XBB15. And I think those of you that listened to probably the May presentations, I ask, how long do you think that's going to last? All right. So the FDA and the CDC and everybody else is saying, don't call it a booster. Okay. Uh, these new vaccines that are being delivered across the country and hopefully tomorrow morning at Nickman Drugstore um, are uh, in the, for the fall and winter virus season, officials are avoiding using the term booster. We're not to call them boosters. Rather, we healthcare professionals and health departments are referring to the doses as the 2023-2024 COVID vaccine or the updated COVID-19 vaccine. The term booster and primary series, oh, that was so April. Yeah, we don't use those terms anymore. That was in April. We stopped saying that. So bye-bye uh, booster, we're no longer giving boosters. It's going to be a very difficult to stop using that word because the word has become so pervasive according to Dr. Keith Tattable, a member of the Center for Disease Control and Prevention's Committee of Vaccine Advisors. He's saying, yeah, try to get that one out of the language. Every one of my patients today that asked me if we had the COVID shot said the COVID booster. All right, let's take a trip. Buckle your seatbelts. We're going to go for a little bit of ride. Uh, we're going to just drive down here on Route 19. We're going to hit uh, Interstate 79. We're going to drive about an hour south to Weston, West Virginia, to the Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum. The Trans-Allegheny Lunatic Asylum, located in Western, Weston, West Virginia, was constructed between 1858 and 1881. Interestingly enough, it was under construction when it was a part of Virginia, as we all know, or maybe uh, we're a little rough on our history, West Virginia broke off of Virginia during the Civil War. And so that's when Virginia said, okay, it's all yours, build it. So the construction occurred between 1858, the Civil War started in the 1861, and uh, 1881 is when they finished construction. It's the largest hand-cut masonry stone building in North America. The only stone-cut building that is bigger than this is the Kremlin. It was built to house 250 patients at its opening. However, the number escalated tenfold, 2,400 by the 1950s. It was closed in 1994 due to changes in the treatment of mental illness and the physical deterioration of the building. So let's even talk about the name. It's a lunatic asylum. Well, at one time, that was a very accepted word. It comes from the word luna, meaning moon. Uh, diseases of madness and epilepsy were thought to be caused by the moon. Obviously, today it's considered to be an archaic term. When used in the vernacular speaking, uh, it describes aberrant behavior, road rage, uh, irrational behavior or eccentricity when we use the term today. However, it took until December 5th, 2012, until the United States House of Representatives passed legislation approved by the U.S. Senate to remove the word lunatic from all federal law. So yes, it's an archaic term for sure, but it took until 2012. Hey, just, you know, 11 years ago till they took the word out of the law books. Asylum. Uh, in a 1930 act, the term asylum was replaced with mental hospital. Today, asylum is defined as the protection granted by a nation to someone who left their native country as a political refugee or shelter or protection from danger. That's what asylum means today. The good news is, is they did change the name to Weston State Hospital in 1913. Well, let's talk about mental health years gone by. Colonial America, the treatment of mental health patients was 
barbaric at best, most were placed in prisons in the company of common criminals, often chained to walls, unclothed, regardless of temperature. They believed at that time that people with mental illness couldn't feel hot and cold, so they didn't need any clothes. And they were even chained to the wall, mired in their own excrement, if they had no family members. In the 1770s, facilities were constructed specifically to house the mentally ill. These places were designated uh, to isolate the patient from society, not to help them reassimilate. So basically what they were saying is this, they knew they couldn't help you. They were just getting you away from people that you might bother. All right, so let's take a look at some people that really made a difference in the world of mental health. The first name is Dorothea Lynn Dix from 1802 to 1887. She was born the eldest daughter of an alcoholic father, born in New Hampshire, uh, left home at age 12 to live and study with her rather wealthy grandmother in Boston. She was a teacher, a Civil War nurse. She was actually the superintendent of Army nurses for the Union. She had a brilliant mind with very little formal education. She was a social reformer whose devotion to the welfare of the mentally ill led her to many widespread international reforms. International. She met with the Pope and told him, Pope Pius IX, Pio Nono, they called him. She met with Pio Nono and told him what he should be doing for the mental health conditions in his country, Italy. After seeing the horrific conditions in the Massachusetts prison, she spent the next 40 years lobbying the United States and Canadian legislators to establish state hospitals for the mentally ill. She's responsible for the construction of 32 institutions in the United States. And as I said, when she was convalescing in Europe in 1854 through 1856, she had Pope, uh, got a hold of Pope Pius IX, had him uh, inspect personally the atrocious conditions that she discovered in Italy, and more or less told the Pope, you got to get this cleaned up. All right. Uh, over here, back to America, we had a Dr. Kirkbride, Thomas Kirkbride, 1809 to 1883. He believed the building, the structure, the facility was part of the cure. Uh, Dr. Kirkbride was born in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. That's near Philadelphia. Uh, his dad was a sturdy farmer who thought Thomas was too frail to farm. So at age 18, he began medical school and graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. That would be Penn in 1832. He developed the Kirkbride plan. The Kirkbride plan was born and for the next several decades would influence the construction of 300 mental asylums, moving patients from city jails and almshouses to rural hospitals. He felt that there was too much commotion in the city. If I moved them to a rural location, then they would uh, do better. He called for a shallow V design with long rambling wings that provided a special therapeutic sunlight and air to comfortable living quarters. He called it a special apparatus for lunacy. Keep in mind, lunacy was a preferred term of the day. So let's take a look at Kirkbride's Hospital. This is the one that uh, my wife, Denise, and I toured. Look at it. It's big. It's expansive. When you look at the plan here at the top, you can see it's a V-shaped. So he had his long, rambling halls and lots of sunlight. Uh, let's take a look at the room, okay? The room, that's just a one-person room, uh, at least when he constructed it. And every room had a window, so he had a lot of bright sunlight, uh, bright walls. They had uh, bright colored walls, and the patients had like their own uh, very simple living quarters. Sure beats being chained to a wall in a dungeon now, doesn't it? So you can see uh, this is, book is the one that uh, Kirkbride book wrote that it's called Hospitals for the Insane. So some treatments that went on in these mental hospitals, one was hydrotherapy. Now, these seem barbaric, and yes, they were. Uh, hydrotherapy, it was thought that the sensation of water moving along the skin would treat conditions including agitation, insomnia, and manic depressive disorder. I mean, we all feel better after a nice warm bath, don't we? Well, they would change the temperature from uh, warm and then cool it down to about 48 degrees, hydrotherapy. And uh, they believed that changing the body temperature would help. The next treatment was the confinement crib. Uh, it's basically a cage, isn't it? And this was more or less reserved for the, for the most difficult patients. 
It's an adult size crib as seen here was widely used by asylums in the 19th century. Cribs were made of various sizes and wooden slats all the way around and secured so the patient could not escape. I would refer to this as a mini jail, but that's a confinement crib, yet another treatment. The tranquilizing chair. This was developed by Dr. Benjamin Rush. And, uh, you know, I get it. We didn't know much back then, but Dr. Rush is considered the father of modern psychi psychiatry. So believing that madness was a result of blood flowing too quickly to the brain, Dr. Benjamin Rush designed this tranquilizing chair to limit patient movements. And then he might uh, move them around in the chair and uh, do everything he could to uh, make sure the blood didn't rush to the brain so quickly. Electroshock therapy, we do this yet in the 20th century. This is for your more recalcitrant patients who don't respond well to the medications we have, whether it's monoamine oxidase inhibitors, whether it's antipsychotics, whether it's the antidepressants, the SSRIs, SNRIs, TCAs, any uh, bupropion, on any of those things, uh, they can use electroshock. And remember when we talked the last time about uh, Patients with postpartum depression, uh, we said once they try and fail on SSRIs and SNRIs and have failed electroshock therapy, then we could use those products that were specific for, uh, for postpartum depression. So electroshock therapy, it's used not a whole lot anymore. All right, so before we had these antipsychotic therapies, we had lobotomies. And I think you might have heard of lobotomies, but yikes, I didn't know how they did them. Uh, first of all, you could get your same day orbital lobotomy for just $5 at this institution. And you can see what they would do. They would take an ice pick and take it, rub it up, run it up the orbitals uh, inside your eye. No anesthesia. They took an ice pick with a hammer, pounded it into your brain, and then scrambled it, essentially. So are you depressed? Do you suffer from anxiety and migraines? You may need a lobotomy. It's good for schizophrenic panic disorder, OCD, chronic pain, violent outbursts, PTSD, ADD, Alzheimer's disease, unmanageable loved ones. And you can just see the improvement in this patient on this flyer. This is the lobotomy chair where they would strap the patient in. And this guy could do like five of them a day. He would walk down the hall and say, mm, yep, pink crackle. Yeah, you look like you need a lobotomy. And they would set you in the chair and they would do your lobotomy. So what does a lobotomy do? Well, first of all, I have the tools for it. And you probably have these in your kitchen. It's an ice pick and a little hammer. So a lobotomy or called a leucotomy is a type of psychosurgery used to treat mental health conditions such as mood disorders and schizophrenia. Psychosurgeries and procedures that involve the physical removal or the alteration of part of the brain. The lobotomies involve separating the tissue in the area called the prefrontal cortex up here. Uh, or alteration, uh, the prefrontal cortex in two ways. They do the frontal lobotomy, which the surgeon would act, actually draw a hole in each side of the skull, cut through the brain tissue with an instrument resembling an ice prick called a leucotome. The ones that they were doing there for just $5, uh, the transorbital lobotomy, the surgeon would insert the leucotome through the eye socket, drove it through the thin layer of bone with a mallet to access the brain. So when I was looking up some stuff for research on this, because I just find this to be fascinating and gruesome, it was banned in the Soviet Union in 1850. Last one that was done in the United States was 1967. Uh, the Russians were ahead of us by 17 years when it comes to stopping the lobotomies. All right, so then we finally got a drug. The drug was called chlorpromazine or Thorazine. You probably have dispensed it in your career. Don't use it a whole lot today because we have a whole lot better antipsychotics. It was marketed by Smith, Klein, and French, SKF. It was approved for schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. It promoted the notion that mental illness, we can fix this, just swallow a pill. It can be cured with medication. Uh, specialty inpatient psychiatric hospitals would no longer be needed and patients wouldn't need that intensive kind of care therapy. They would just have to swallow a pill. Everything would be fine and it wouldn't be so darn expensive because all they had to do was swallow a pill. 
So emptying the mental health hospitals happened pretty quickly after Thorazine came out. The Mental Retardation Facilities and Community Health Centers Construction Act was signed in 1963 by John F. Kennedy. Remember, John had a John Kennedy had a sister, uh, Rose, that was institutionalized, and they did do a lobotomy on her. So he was very much in the in the know about mental health issues. Uh, John Kennedy signed it in 1963. It was actually the last piece of legislation John F. Kennedy shot before he was assassinated in Dallas. The purpose was to allow patients to live in the community and get outpatient psychiatric clinics and get good care there. In 1965, Lyndon Baines Johnson signed Medicaid legislation, stipulated that the federal government would not pay for inpatient care in psychiatric hospitals. The population of people living in asylums dropped from a high of more than a half a million in 1955 to barely more than 100,000 in the mid 80s. Uh, prisons, however, the prison population has increased. The prison population has increased from 85,000 in 1925 to 1 million. 404,000 in 2010. And I think most of us will agree that the mental health hospitals being emptied, where did those people go? Many of them ended up in prison. Many of them are homeless, living under bridges in a city or town near you. Well, you know, we like to have experts here. And uh, I didn't have to look too far to find an expert on mental health issues. Uh, this is a uh, wasn't my tour guide, but uh, she went along with me. This is my wife, Denise Kavitsky Crackle. Uh, Denise is a graduate of 19, uh, 1981, graduate of the University of Pittsburgh School of Pharmacy. She was my lab partner. And for those of you guys with, that know the alphabet, uh, Kavitsky and Crackle, we were side by side at Pitt. Uh, she has worked primarily in the retail end of practice and direct patient care disciplines in the pharmacy profession. She has a vast array, much more expertise than I do, of mental health pharmacy positions and has always provided her patients with compassionate mental health services for a very long time. You're gonna be fascinated with her story. She has had vast experiences from substance use patients to patients recently released from prisons. So it's my pleasure to introduce to you Denise Kibitsky Krekel. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, good to be here. Well, let's get started. Uh, in 1975, Denise was a junior at Hollidaysburg High School. In Hollidaysburg, they have a state mental hospital. And she went as a junior to volunteer there to uh, visit the patients. So I want you, Denise, to share your experiences with your weekly visits as a high school junior to the Hollidaysburg State Hospital. Well, if you look at the timeline, um, 1963 was whenever President Kennedy signed, um, signed his bill on mental health. And then I didn't go to the state hospital until 1975. Why did I go? Our The state, Hollidaysburg State Hospital was maybe five or six blocks from our high school. So our advanced biology teacher thought it would be a good experience for us. So once a week for a semester in the evenings, I would go out to the state hospital and talk to the patients. Um, it was really an interesting experience for um, a junior in high school. Kind of scary because you always saw that building in your town, but nobody ever went in there, didn't know what was going on in there. So um, you walked into the building and you had to sign in. It was everybody was locked up. There's one of those little windows and you have to be um, have to get permission to go in to see the patients. So we did that. But the reason I went to the holidays for state hospital was um, as an experience from my advanced biology teacher. So what were the patients like? Did you get to see lots of them or was there one you were assigned to or how did that work? We could visit anybody we wanted to in the hospital, but um, after talking to several of the patients, there was one lady in particular that I bonded with. And so every week when I came to the hospital, I'd go and speak with her. And we had very nice visits every time that we um, we visited. It um, She was, she, um, she was very well behaved. She carried on conversations, um, but she took her medication. So um, she probably so because which makes a difference. She was taking her medications. 
She had um, her hair on her bangs, they were yellow colored. Her fingers were yellow stained. Um, her, on, and her face was very chapped. And why were they chapped and where did the yellow come from? Yellow came from smoking. So um, many patients with schizophrenia do smoke and she smoked very heavily, obviously, because her hands and her hair were stained. What did she look like? So um, at that point, I was a high school junior. You know, I had no idea what medications did to, did to people. So she was obviously on Thorazine. She had tardive dyskinesia and she had the lip smacking and she had um, a big U-shaped chap area on her chin, which was from the tardive dyskinesia. So you got to see it firsthand. Today, you would know exactly what it is. Okay, let's let's go a few more years. This is after you uh, you, you met your uh, fiance in pharmacy school, 1980. She lands the dream job as an intern at the Veterans Hospital in Altoona, being paid five bucks an hour, and I was being paid two bucks an hour, but I'm not bitter. Uh, in the summer of 1980, <laughs> you landed this job at the Altoona Veterans Administration Hospital. Tell us about the prescriptions you filled, and did you have a lot of consultations, or was this mostly mail order? The Veterans Hospital was a dream job. It was Monday through Friday and got paid extremely well. And even as an intern, I ended up with a week's paid vacation at the end of the summer. Amazing. Um, the prescriptions that we frequently filled there, we did all kinds of blood pressure, mental health medications. Um, the mental health medications were basically Thorazine back then. And the Thorazine, we had bottles of 1,000 to 5,000. They were huge. Um, and we dispensed dispensed lots of those to the outpatients. There was one wing that was um, mental health patients. They didn't let me as an intern go up there. So I didn't have a lot of experience on the mental health wing, but we did fill lots of prescriptions and we mailed them out. Okay, so Thorazine was your go-to drug, right? It was. And, and you have to remember, we've been doing this so long that Captopril wasn't approved when you were uh, dispensing back then. Can you imagine dispensing blood pressure medications and you didn't have aces or arms? All right, let's let's uh, let's get married. Let's uh, have about 25 years under our belt. You made another change. She moves to Sunpoint Health as their clinical pharmacist. Uh, she also, at that time, uh, worked at uh, one of the health systems where she established, you know, retail uh, pharmacy in a very busy clinic, grew that like crazy. And then she uh, went to Sunpoint Health, uh, which is one of the most affluent areas between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, State College, Pennsylvania, home of Penn State University. So there's a lot of professors. There's a lot of money up there, and there's a big area around there with a lot of less affluent communities like Tyrone. That's where we lived, and Phillipsburg and Lewistown. Now, what challenges did this population bring to you uh, where you had all of this affluence and a lot of connections? And you, the Sunpoint Health Clinic was big. You had, what, about five or six psychiatrists? Um, State College was lucky that they had that many psychiatrists. Um, you probably now working in, in pharmacy that that is one of our biggest challenges is getting um, psychiatrists. There aren't nearly enough of them for all of our patients. The patient um, clientele, there were very many wealthy people in State College, but the clinic, um, it drew people from two and three hours away. Unfortunately, mental health still has um, its, its Tractors and people and a stigma. People don't want anybody to know that they have mental health problems. So we would have patients come from maybe two or three hours away. They would not would say, "Do not bill my insurance company." They didn't want their the medications being billed by the insurance company. They didn't want their office visits billed by the insurance company. So and we had the money to do this. They had the money to do it, and they paid cash for their medications and. For, for their office visits. The medications that we would use in ADHD was in 2007, we were using a lot of ADH medications. Um, we were starting to use um, Suboxone. Um, it was introduced a few years before that, but it was just starting, starting to get the ball rolling. And it's, Suboxone 
this used a whole lot right now, but back then it used to less than seven. And a lot of pharmacies would carry it and a lot and a lot of prescribers would not prescribe it. And you had to get the X waiver to be able to do that. But when um, our clinicians um, prescribed the Suboxone and we also did Plazeril, um, that one required is for um, the antipsychotic for schizophrenia. And it requires a lot of monitoring. So uh, we being located inside the mental health clinic, we did we did the monitoring. People would get the blood work. When the first six months, you had to do it every week. You had to get the absolute neutrophil front done. So the patients could only get one week supply at a time. And then they had to get the blood work done. So after six months, then they would only have to get it every couple of weeks. But it was um, a lot of monitoring. It worked well for many patients, but um, it was very strict in timing. Okay. Well, let's take uh, our last visit, our last slide here. And then uh, you left that very good job uh, in that health system. And then you decided you wanted to work for Center Volunteers in Medicine. Uh, Denise was their first clinical pharmacist. You've probably heard me uh, talk about her running 2,400 shot COVID clinics up in State College in one of the middle schools. Uh, did amazing, amazing work at CVIM. But the part that we want you to talk about tonight is tell us about mental health services. Before you were hired, pharm uh, we had physicians and volunteer pharmacists would check the prescriptions that were processed by a tech. And then you came in full time, which was how many hours a week were you doing? 12 hours to begin with, and it expanded then it, to 20. So. Then it expanded to 20. So how did you expand mental health services, and what challenges did you see with this population? You're still in state college and all this affluence, but now you're dealing with uninsured people and many people who were recently incarcerated. So the mental health services, we were very fortunate, Center Volunteers in Medicine. We have very good grant writers and um, very great office staff that and directors that would apply for any program that was out there. And we were able to hire a one of the best psychiatrists in State College. He had a real passion for these people and um, wanted to work with us. So he came to work for Center of Volunteers Medicine. So we had our own psychiatrist, we had our own psychologist, which was awesome. Um, but in order to, to have those and make um, the treatment complete, you need medications too, because we need the psychologists to talk to our patients, we need psychiatrists to, but we also need the medications. So that created a challenge for me. How do we get these medications? These people don't have any insurance and um, they're very, very expensive. Uh, so we uh, were able to use um, some great some technicians and we were able to apply for the medications directly to from the um, drug companies, and we call it a MAP program, medication assistance program. So drugs that were injectable drugs that would help for schizophrenia, the antipsychotics such as um, Invega that are used, um, we were able to get the injectables, which were once a month. You can use it once a month, three times a month, or there's a new one that you use just twice a year. Um, so we're able to get those for free for our patients. So we're able to get the injectables some of them we looked at, like I looked at Zepraxa one, the one the psychiatrist said, oh, um, the patients are not very compliant or adherent to medication. Can you see if you can get me some Zepraxa for free? I did, but oh my goodness, the, um, the monitoring for it, the injecting and um, giving the injection and having to, the patient had to sit in the office, I think it was for almost a half a day. So, I mean, it was just incredible as to all the limitations on it and all the monitoring that I said, I don't think we want to, um, to do that if we don't have to. So we, we used other injectables, but even with the injectables, we had a hard time getting the patients in every month, even just once a month to get the, um, take their medications. So that's the biggest thing is um, adherence. All right. So we were just up to uh, the Center of Volunteers in Medicine, where she worked previously. It was a small little uh, clinic on Green Tech Drive. They, because of the COVID efforts and so many other major efforts and donations, they're in this massive new facility. We got to tour it. And I'll tell you, I haven't seen brand name Prozac in probably 10 years. They have Prozac 
brand name from Lily, shelves of it, brand name Cymbalta, brand name everything on the shelves because of the efforts that Denise made in showing them how to do it, that uh, the poorest of the poor people were getting most expensive medications because she was able to make those connections with the drug companies. And that's why just to review with everyone, we can all make a difference in our patients' lives, whether they're mental health patients or that little old lady that comes in today for a shingle shot. So Denise, thank you so much. You. And uh, I hope we can meet again. Well, <laughs> half an hour, right? All right, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so Mrs. Crackle, as you can see, has a whole lot of experience with, uh, with mental health. And so let's get into some of those drugs that she was uh, so good at dispensing. Let's talk about schizophrenia, first of all. A schizophrenia affects about 1% of the world's population, and it's diagnosed primarily on the presentation of psychotic symptoms. Uh, they always said that if you were in prison and you wanted to take psych meds, all you had to do is tell them you were hallucinating. Not that I have any prison experience. Uh, patients suffering from schizophrenia often present themselves with concomitant negative symptoms like apathy, ahedonia, which means nothing makes them happy or pleases them, and cognitive dysfunction. And it's the dopamine receptor, D2 receptors, responsible for schizophrenia. So researchers have been able to... Uh, confirmed that patients with schizophrenia show an increased presynaptic dopamine synthesis, increased dopamine release, increased synaptic levels of dopamine with a largely unchanged postsynaptic dopamine receptor de density. So let's block dopamine. Now, yesterday I gave a lecture for the Parkinson's patients and we wanted with them all the dopamine we could get. So we were figuring out ways to block do it, what dopa decarboxylase, catecholamine, O-methyltransferase, as well as monoamine oxidase. This is the exact opposite. This is the opposite. This is, we want the dopamine levels to be blocked. Okay, well, nicotine, a 2019 uh, nicotine study stated that 80% of the people living with schizophrenia smoked, like Mrs. Crackle's patients with the yellow fingers, the yellow hair. Uh, studies found that those living with schizophrenia may smoke more because prescribed medications can enhance the effects of nicotine. Uh, antipsychotics that are potent dopamine D2 antagonists have been linked to elevated levels of nicotine dependence. So activation of D2 receptors mediates motivation for nicotine. Remember, dopamine is also your pleasure hormone. Nicotine stimulates dopamine neurons via the nicotinic acetylcholine receptors in the ventral tegmental area, causing a release of dopamine into the striatal synapsis. So uh, we sure seem to be saying dopamine a lot. Evidence indicates that treatment with, post, with potent antipsychotics increases smoking in individuals with schizophrenia. So let's talk about the first generation antipsychotics. We're going to blow through these because maybe you know them, maybe you don't, but it's these are nice charts that I want you to print out. You can always print out my slides. You know, you're allowed to steal them. Uh, drug names of Thorazine, Perfenazine, Flufenazine, Trifluoroperazine, and Thioridazine. I haven't dispensed Melaril in years. I have had a patient or two on trifluoroperazine in the past 10 years, maybe. Uh, we still use a fair amount of uh, perfenazine, however. And you look at these drugs, they all came out about the time Denise and I were born. I didn't know I did that to my mother, I guess. Um, first generation antipsychotics from 1967 to 75. We had thiothixine, navane, haloperidol, haldol. We had mesiterine or sorrentol, molindone or moban, and lox. So the last brand new antipsychotic came out in 1975. So we didn't have any mental health drugs really after 1975, new treatments, let's call them, for schizophrenia. So let's talk about those first generation antipsychotics and some prescribing notes. The first thing to remember with them is they're all pretty good. What the docs are looking for, and you should too, is 
Let's take a look at the side effect profile. So the mechanism of action, these first generation agents work in the central nervous system by blocking dopamine two receptors. And they block about 92% of the D2 receptors in the brain. So when we're looking at a Parkinson's patient, Parkinson's patients lose about 80% of their dopamine uh, nerves, we could call them, uh, the dopamine receptors. They lose about 80% of them before they even present with Parkinson's disease. Shows you how resilient the brain is. In general, efficacy in treating patients with schizophrenia, it's similar for all of them. They all work real well, but their side effect profiles are different. So the first generation antipsychotics are implicated with weight gain, possibly due to increased appetite due to the serotonin receptors and dopamine blockade. Increased sedation and decreased physical activity, it slows them down because of that H1 receptor blocker. Think Benadryl, makes you sleepy, makes you groggy. Well, if they have this histaminic uh, type uh, blockade, guess what? They're going to get sleepy. And although it's controversial, antipsychotic induced weight gain does not appear to be dose related. They say it's the chemical itself, it doesn't matter how much. So the pharmacodynamic profile, the second generation antipsychotics, which is the serotonin. Uh, 2A antagonism, more common, uh, is the most common. It has fa they have faster dissociation and 5-HT1 or serotonin agonism. So the profiles for the second generation are a little bit different. So uh, we don't see them getting all of the side effects. The major difference between the first and second generation antipsychotics from a receptor binding perspective, are the first generation potent block dopamine. The second ones affect dopamine and serotonin receptors. Let's take a look at the second generation. Denise was talking about Clausrel. You know, Clausrel was the first one and it's still the best one. But those side effects, if we could come out with something as effective as Clausrel, without the side effects uh, that require the blood monitoring for the white cells. Came out in 1989. We can see that it's EPS extra pyramidal symptoms. Okay, the Parkinsonian-like symptoms doesn't have any because it has high anticholinergic. Remember in your Parkinson's patients, they do take anticholinergics to, uh, to help with their Parkinson's symptoms. So, and high anticholinergic usually attenuates extrapyramidal symptoms. Weight gain, extremely high. Uh, four, five plus. I saw patients uh, with that. They go to the Clausero Clinic together. It's a husband and wife. And they unfortunately have huge problems with their weight. Uh, Risperdone or Risperdal, that came out in 1993. You see it has low sedation, but it has high extrapyramidal symptoms because it has no anticholinergic effects. Uh, risperidone, also think galactorea as well. Olanzapine or Zyprexa, that has uh, moderate sedation, low extrapyramidal and uh, moderate anticholinergic and very high weight gain. I saw a kid gain 75 pounds on Zyprexa in a year. Uh, quetiapine is more moderate for weight loss. Uh, Zepristidone and Abilify, moderate to low weight loss. Uh, Geodon is definitely low weight loss. So you can see what most psychiatrists are looking at is that weight gain column is the first one. And then of course, extra pyramidal symptoms would come in second. So part two, we have uh, paliperidone, acenaphine, iloperidone, lyricidone, brexpiprazole, cariprazine, and lumapterone. So you can see uh, these, the side effects become a little bit cleaner. Look how clean Latuta is. Uh, moderate sedation, low EPS, low anticholinergic, and low weight gain. And something else with uh, Larissadone or Latuda, that along with Clausrel are both pregnancy category B. They are the two safest drugs to give to a pregnant patient. So again, we're not going to go through these uh, line by line. Uh, print them out, review them. They're a really good reference for you to have. So prescribing notes for second generation antipsychotics. Hey, here are your quiz questions I'd tell my St. Francis student. Weight gain, clozapine and olanzapine, the worst. Weight neutral, zeprisidone, aripiprazole, acenapine, and lyricidone. However, that acenapine is noticed, noted for causing rashes. Uh, pregnancy category B, 
Lozapine and Larisadone, safest for cardiac patients, minimal QRS lengthening, aripiprazole, Larisadone, and olanzapine. Lozapine is used, has its own unique efficacy in treatment-resisting schizophrenic. It's probably the most potent anti-schizophrenic drug that we have. All of the other atypicals, they're all of equal potency. Just look for the different side effects. Of the three exceptions, aripiprazole and brexpiprazole are D2 receptor partial agonists, and cariprazine is a D3 preferred D3, D2 receptor partial agonist. I don't know how they keep this stuff straight, but you can see loose dissociation with that receptor. Uh, reduced risk for extrapyramidal symptoms is postulated on being a loose attachment to the D2 binding and rapid dissociation rates and preferred binding for the drugs in the limbic and cortical brain regions rather than the striatal region. So where are these dopamine receptors? How is it binding? How tight is it binding? And how loose is it binding? For risperidone, that's the one that causes galactorrhea. Uh, Risperidone has the highest risk of extrapyramidal symptoms. You would never give this drug to a Parkinson's patient. Uh, 60 to 70% of the patients taking paliperidone and risperidone do experience sexual side effects. Examples of the long-acting injections that Mrs. Crackle was talking about, and there's more, but I put the big ones on that you are most likely to see, and their duration of action. The brand name ones, Abilify Mantena is one month, and Aristata Extended Release. Now, that's the long-acting Aristata is two months. Look at the paliperidone. She said she was dispensing a lot of the Sustena, which was one month, and then the Trinza, which is three months, and now we have in Vega Hapiera, Half year, uh, hey, that's an easy one. Six months you get out of that. Risperidone has a product, Perseris ER, which is one month. Risperidol Consta is two weeks. And the Zyprexa Relprev that Denise was talking about that required all of that monitoring, so they didn't want to use that. That's a good four-week injection. But again, the monitoring is the challenge. So let's do our first assessment question. Which of the following antipsychotics is for treatment-resistant schizophrenia? Is it prolixin, flufenazine, latuda, lorisidone, clozaril, clozapine, or brexpeprazole, rixalti? I'll give you 15 seconds to key in your answer. Go ahead and do that now. All right, let's see how everyone did. Which of the following antipsychotics is for treatment resistant? That's right, clozapine or clozaril. Hey, you did well on that. Good job. Uh, that is the correct answer. Answer C. All right, so let's go to one of my favorites. Hey, consult of the month. So uh, this actually came with my wife. We were, uh, oh, we were at her Uncle Chuck's funeral and one of her. Cousins came up and said, hey, you're a pharmacist. I was just started on thyroid meds. And they started me on 25 microgram. But my buddy has thyroid problems. He said I should be on a higher dose. What do you think? Okay, let's go about dosing thyroid hormones. Let's dig into the answer here. Well, uh, diagnosis, we use TSH levels to determine whether a person needs a thyroid medication or not. TSH levels should fall between 0 0.4 and 6, depending on your lab. I've seen that number is 0 0.4 to 4. Uh, the starting dose is usually 25 to 50. If the patient has underlying cardiovascular disease, it's going to go to the 25 side. Maintenance dose, the average full replacement dose is about 1.6 to 1.7 micrograms per kilogram per day. So if you got a 70 kilogram patient, they're going to take 100 to 125 micrograms a day. For the elderly, that might be even half or a third of the dose, and you're going to adjust it down if the BMI is over 30. So if you have a really heavy person, they might not be going to, uh, on the 1.6 micrograms per kilogram per day. So for most patients over 50 or younger than 50 with cardiovascular disease, start them on 25 to 50. Gradually increase the dose to six to eight weeks as needed, depending on that TSH level. Got to get a lot of blood work those first six months to get your dose knocked down. So for the elderly patients with heart disease, start at 12.5 to 25 micrograms per day. 
gradually increase it. Your average elderly maintenance is 0.5 to 0.1 micrograms per day maintenance. So patient care points, I hope you're familiar with all of them. Levothyroxine is ideally dosed in the morning, 30 minutes before any food is eaten. Uh, we have drug interactions with the dye and trivalent cations. Avoid them within four hours. They should be given on an empty stomach an hour before or two or three hours after. Most importantly, tell patients to be consistent so the dose can be titrated to an appropriate TSH. And finally, if a patient is on an oral bisphosphonate, a lot of your older ladies are on bisphosphonate therapy as well as thyroid. Uh, they take their lendronate first thing in the morning on an empty stomach. The levothyroxine uh, would then, uh, when this happens, suggest taking the levothyroxine 30 minutes after the bisphosphonate. So you'll take your lendronate first, wait 30 minutes, then take your levothyroxine, then go eat. Okay, uh, 30 minutes later. So taking it at bedtime four hours after the last meal can work as well. The most important thing, and I know it's been written up in some of the literature you might read, the most important thing is consistent, consistent, consistent. All right, so follow-up care, all patients check the TSH level every six to eight weeks until they have a normal thyroid level. When the TSH levels are normal, then they can be checked every six to 12 months. Once the patients are stabilized, not much happens until they reach the age of eh, 60 or 70 because they have a decrease in albumin and the binding sites cause an increase in the freer hormone. There's less to bind up and hold on to, so you have more free uh, thyroid hormones floating around. Dosages may need to be decreased by as much as 20%. All right, so are the generics just as good? And this is a hot button topic, and I'm gonna, at the uh, end of the program, ask you for your opinion. Uh, therapeutic equivalents. Uh, I'm the guy that wrote an article back in 1993 that said there are four drugs you should never substitute. Lanoxin, Dilantin, Humidin, and Synthroid. Let's talk about Synthroid. So drug products are considered to be therapeutic equivalents only if they are pharmaceutical equivalents for which the bioequivalence has been demonstrated, and they can be expected to have the same clinical effect in the same profile when administered to patients under the conditions specified in the labeling. The official definition. Okay, so here's where things get crazy. The FDA rated these products. So Synthroid... Uh, According to the Orange Book, was coded AB1 and AB2. Levoxyl, another brand name by King Pharmaceuticals, was coded AB1 and AB3. Levo-T was coded, uh, coded AB1, AB2, and AB3. Unithroid by Jerome Stevens was coded AB1, AB2, AB3. Levothroid by Forest Pharmaceuticals is coded AB4. And levothyroxine is coded AB1, AB2, AB3, and AB4. So essentially, you could not give levothroid to somebody on Synthroid because it's coded AB4 and Synthroid's considered to be co coded AB1. So I found this really cool chart just to show you what crazy looks like, okay? So as far as the interchangeability goes, let's take a look at Synthroid. It's coded uh, AB1, okay? Levoxyl AB1. However, Mylan is the is the monkey wrench in the whole machine. Mylan, as I said, is coded AB1, AB2, AB3, and AB4. So you can use Mylan to substitute for Synthroid, Levoxyl, Levo T, any of those. You can, it can substitute any thyroid product. But you can't substitute, uh, like, say, Synthroid for uh, Levo T. You, can, you can't do these conversions back and forth if it's an AB1 versus an AB4, but my land covers them all. So you're saying A equals B, B equals C, C equals D, but A doesn't equal D. I mean, aren't they all really the same if my land has one product? It can be substituted for all of them. So uh, I find it to be crazy. We asked the FDA for help and they didn't do much for us. Speaking of the FDA, uh, let's see what's new with the FDA. What's the new drug approval? Denied. They denied a drug. Uh, it's called NEFI, administering epinephrine without a needle. Epinephrine nasal spray, NEFI, was manufactured by ARS. 
And uh, the FDA regulators decided on Tuesday, September 20th, just last week, uh, that more data was needed to evaluate the safety of repeated doses of the nasal spray before it could be approved. Can you imagine? Um, indication of emergency treatment of allergic reactions type one, including anaphylaxis in adults and children over 30 kilograms. This is the same spray device that they use for Narcan or Cloxato. Uh, they wanted approval due to the inconvenience of carrying around large auto injectors or for patients with needle phobia. So uh, they said, no, 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 Nephi. ARS stated, the company that makes it, as many 85% of the patients who face severe allergies would be willing to carry epinephrine around with them daily if Nephi was approved. Their survey suggested around 55% of the current options of injectable uh, epinephrine devices. So 55% um, of the people said they'll carry an EpiPen. 85% said, I'll carry an Epi. An Epi nasal spray works by delivering a dose of epinephrine to the patients uh, facing allergic attacks using two other technologies already used. Hey, epinephrine has been around forever. So has that device. So how it works, it's called dodecyl maltoside, and it's licensed under the drug maker Norellus is especially useful for solubilizing membrane proteins to preserve their activity. So this enhances drug absorption through the mucous membrane. So this dodecyl maltoside is already used. It's already approved by the FDA, the ingredient that delivers the epinephrine. So the epi is approved, the dodecyl maltoside is approved, the device is approved and the FDA says, no, 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 nephi. So uh, dodecyl maltocytes uh, being used currently in migraine treatment, uh, sumatriptan, which is called tosimra, and for seizure clusters, alcohol delirium treatment, uh, it's a diazepam called baltoco. So already approved, but they said, no, 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 do nephi. So what's next for nephi? Well, believe me, ARS was taken by surprise because the PODAC, the Pulmonary Allergy Advisory Committee recommended Nephi's approval uh, without any additional data. They voted 16 to 6. I mean, it wasn't even close in favor of using Nephi in adults and 17 to 5 in favor of usage in kids. The requested pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic study would compare repeated doses of Nephi to an epinephrine injection in allergen-induced induced allergic rhinitis conditions. This request to complete the study before approval is a reversal of the previous discussion by the FDA and ARS. So ARS is not happy. They're going to file a formal dispute to appeal the demand, uh, which was made as part of the complete response letter. So the FDA says, we need more studies. We need to see that if you do the use uh, subsequent uh, doses of NEPI, is it as good as subsequent doses of the injection? And uh, ARS is not happy. And so they are filing a dispute. So we'll kind of watch that too. Uh, let's go to assessment question number two, which is the following levothyroxine manufacturers have a rating of AB1, AB2, AB3, and AB4. Is it Geneva Generics, Eba, Sandoz, or Milan? Go ahead and key in your answer now. All right, let's go ahead and get your answer. Is it Geneva Generics, Teva, Sandoz, or Mylan? Oh, good job. You got it. My land. My land is AB1, AB2, AB3, and AB4 rated. Good job. So our editorial today on Pharmacy Times, uh, here's what everybody's talking about. You know, is the FDA doing its job? When they turn down something like Nephi, and yet they do something like give us AB1, AB2, AB3, and AB4 ratings. What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on generic substitution for levothyroxine? I want you to type in on your uh, chat and let's, let's get a little discussion going here these last few minutes we have. Are the physicians in your dispensing area okay or not okay? Did the FDA do its job in advising us about the appropriate substitution of levothyroxine? I pulled some prices down from GoodRx for you just to make a good discussion. Uh, generic levothyroxine, 1292, 90 Synthroid brand, 100 micrograms, 154.77. 
Well, what are you going to be doing? Uh, let's say you were put on uh, a thyroid medication. You'd be taking the brand or would you be taking the generic? Go ahead, type in your ideas and your comments now in the chat box, and we'll talk for a couple more minutes. Uh, I have had uh, some very notable endocrinologists uh, discuss with me that they only wanted the brand name Synthroid. And the one endocrinologist was from Hershey, Pennsylvania. And I said to him, you know, about the, the AB1, AB2, AB3, and AB4 ratings for my land pharmaceuticals. And he wasn't familiar with that. And so I explained it to him and he said, let's just agree to disagree. I said, well, that's kind of what you would say if uh, perhaps, yeah, I think uh, opposite of me, but didn't want to say it. For levothyroxine, remember, it depends, let's see what this says, on what the manufacturer submits to the FDA for review. If the data isn't submitted, they're not able to make a decision. That definitely uh, has a part in it, but I don't think that trickles down to us people on the bench that can't sit and review data all the time. I think we kind of want the FDA to maybe help us out in making those kinds of decisions. Uh, everybody so far is saying generic, 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 uh, for levothyroxine. Okay, thank you. Um, generic, generic thyroid patient here. Doctor says consistency is most important. Same time with the same manufacturer. And a lot of uh, the docs will say that. You can stay on your generic, but just tell your pharmacist not to change it. That's a nice meeting in the middle of the road, too. Uh, I think we can uh, we can do that, too. Uh, one says, I'll take the brand. Okay. The primary endocrinologist in Southern NM insists on only Synthroid. I disagree. Uh, and not to get into a fight with an endocrinologist, but sometimes, you know, they are so uh, visited and frequented by the brand name companies. Maybe show them this and say, I'm not challenging your clinical judgment and assessment, but can you explain to me how you think this might work? Where did the FDA get an AB1, AB2, AB3, and AB4 rating for my land that you could substitute my land for any of the four products, but the other ones you can't exchange? Seems like my patients that take Synthroid are adamant and they only get the brand and claim the generic won't work. I can't help but think it's a placebo effect, but personally, I'd do the generic myself. I think that's what I think most of us are seeing on the bench. Uh, they, patients that are taking brand are happy to pay for it. I'd be taking the generic every time. All right, it's 8.02. We had a wonderful Wonderful news and views, and I do want to thank, and I will thank her when I walk out uh, to the other room in our house out of my office and tell her thank you. Uh, Denise, I think, did a wonderful job uh, showing all of us that the mental health uh, crisis that we have in this country is only going to be solved by more of us healthcare professionals providing compassionate care. I want to thank you so much for joining me for Achieve CE. I have another program. It's on Friday at 10 o'clock. Topics, medication errors. So uh, if you need some more credits to fulfill your Florida license, you can join us then. We know there are a lot of places you can get your continuing education, but we're so glad you chose Achieve CE. Thank you so much and good night.